Okay, so I think I'm done with my spiel and I'm gonna hand this over to Richard Rueda, who is our uh, Career Connect Digital Content Manager. So take it away, Richard. Well, thank you, Aliyah. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to our Can't Touch This Virtual Work Experience. Uh, in just a moment, I'm gonna introduce Sue. Um, I just wanna add on to what Aliyah was saying and promote two quick things. We have a really cool site as a summer and spring nears uh, transition programs uh, of which many of you run are gonna be really up and running. And we have the new transition hub we launched two years ago. I don't know a lot, if you don't put it in the chat, I will, but it's aphconnectcenter.org forward slash transition hub. And from there you can, it's a searchable database from coast to coast of all transition programs that we have gathered thus far since July of last year that talk and promote residential and non-residential work experience pre-ETS, pre-employment transition program. So as it's very relevant to today's talk, um, definitely check that out. And we're adding more every day. Uh, we, we've got somebody on board. The last thing I will say is um, our new series, Career Connections, Career Conversations, that is, uh, launched this month. And it'll be the first Thursday of each month at 6 Eastern and running for an hour. In that hour, we interview a blind professional working in the field. Last month, it was Lucy Greco, Accessibility Evangelist. Next week, we have the opportunity to interview Gina Harper, financial uh, consultant, vice president with Morgan Stanley, and she manages huge accounts. And she's well known and one of the very few blind women who are working in that field. And so we will get to interview her and then we open it up to you, the audience, job seekers, transition age youth and adults to ask her questions. So join us for that as well. It gives me a great pleasure to uh, host today's presentation through the Career Connect platform here at the Connect Center. Sue Glazer is a friend and colleague I've known for a little, oh, close to two years since I've joined the Connect Center. And Sue runs some outstanding transition programs out of Florida with close to 20 years uh, working in the field. Um, very knowledgeable person. A lot of us are have considered or have thought of, have put our, you know, dipped our toe in the water, if you will, and figuring out how do we manage transition programs, whether it's in person, hybrid, or virtual. And Sue's going to give us some really good examples during today's presentation on the virtual work experience. Um, she's got a really cool PowerPoint. I hope you will stick with us. It's, it's going to be amazing. Uh, definitely put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. And uh, Sue Glazer, Transition Program Coordinator out of the Lighthouse of Tampa. Sue, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Elia. Um, very, very excited to be here. Any opportunity to talk about transition, uh, I love to jump on it. So I appreciate that. And uh, like Richard said, I'm going on uh, my 20th year of running the transition program for the Lighthouse for the Blind and Low Vision in Tampa. And it doesn't feel like that long at all. Uh, but we've done some great things, as I know um, all of you have out there. And I'm a, a teacher of students with visual impairments and an orientation and mobility instructor. I actually did my uh, T TVI and o and internship at the Indiana School for the Blind. Uh, so I was really excited to see somebody here from ISB. Uh, that's really neat. Brings back a lot of great memories. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, start my presentation. And you will um, get to see how we figured this out. I know everybody was kind of thrown into what do we do suddenly in the spring of 2020 when uh, we started going into lockdown and changing instruction from face to face to virtual and trainings were coming out left and right. People had, um, I know for one, I was, I was a little overwhelmed with all of the options and um, took a little while to figure out what's best for our group, what's, what's gonna get students engaged, get them attending. We always, every year for our summer transition program, we would have a, a pretty decent turnout of 20 to 27 students signed up. Uh, so we were really, really worried that the summer of 2020, that we weren't gonna be able to, to reach many students that really benefit and enjoy coming to the program. So we knew our top priority was it had to be engaging, it had to be motivating, it had to be fun and uh, obviously meaningful and purposeful for the students. So I'm gonna go over what we did, what worked well, um, some ideas to, to get started or to carry forward and integrate what you're probably already doing. Uh, so we 
named our theme. Every summer we have a different theme. This particular summer, we appropriately called it Can't Touch This. And yes, we played the song almost every day. Uh, teachers danced on the screen. We sang. We tried to embarrass our teenage students as much as possible because that's, that's one thing we get to do as teachers. Uh, so I wanted to just carry that forward for this presentation. And here we go. So our summer, we, caught, we started calling it the summer e-transition. Um, just kind of jumping on everything was e this and electronic that and virtual. So we're trying to stay with the times. It took a, a great deal of staff and effort and resources to make this happen, but we figured it out thanks to all of our support and everybody just jumping in and having the same purpose, which was to, to really make this incredible program for our teenagers and young adults. So in Florida, we have a Florida Division of Blind Services. Um, they contract with um, CRPs, the Community Rehabilitation Providers, to provide transition programs. So most of our funding comes from Division of Florida Division of Blind Services and then other grants and um, fundraising efforts and things that, that we do at our local office. Uh, but we had the Florida Division of Blind Services uh, covering two district offices and program coordinators, myself in Tampa, and we had another program coordinator in Winter Haven that's from a different district. One thing that was really uh, worked out well because we did it virtually, we have two, our agency has two locations in different districts in Tampa and Winter Haven. Since we were doing it virtually, we decided to combine both of our groups, which we don't normally get to do because of the distance. So that was right off the right off the bat, one of the benefits of having the virtual program, which then also got us more resources, more teachers, more support from uh, our DBS offices. Uh, so actual teachers that were doing our day-to-day -day activities and instruction and planning, we had eight. And all of our teachers were either a teacher of the visually impaired, an O&M instructor, or both. Um, worked in, in some area of ESC, and um, we had some that were maybe a paraprofessional who worked in the field. So we, had, we utilized them as aides and teaching assistants. Um, our LBLV staff, so Lighthouse for the Blind and Low Vision. Uh, obviously, we all work for the Lighthouse, but we, we sometimes pull in other folks, like maybe one of our job uh, development specialists or technology specialists. So we, we pulled in a few extras for um, some activities here and there. In, in all, we had 23 students attend. I think we, we started with 27 registered. And then by the time the first day came around, we had 23. And we were all pleasantly surprised, uh, be very honest. We weren't sure if they were going to come, and they did. And then the second day when they all came back, we were even even more uh, elated. So that was, that was really great. Uh, overall, throughout the summer, we had a total of 20 guest speakers. Here's another benefit from, from the virtual program is that we've never had 20 guest speakers in any of our programs before in a five week period. So we really took advantage of everyone being comfortable all of a sudden with the virtual platform. We had guest speakers from six different states around the US. Uh, which again, we would not be able to do if we were face-to-face. -face. So we really got to target students' interests and, and reach out of our, um, just the, the physical proximity that we normally were confined to. We used the virtual platform of Zoom utilizing breakout rooms. Uh, so we definitely saw the benefit of having the main Zoom room as if that's our main meeting room, our big group sessions, and then having breakout rooms for individual classes. And we offer 20 days of instruction. So we did five weeks with four days per week. And we met approximately from 9 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. on those days. And some days varied. Some were longer, some were shorter. So that's kind of an overview. And then we have our teachers, the untouchables, because we are all untouchable. Can't touch this. Uh, that, was, that was the one thing that everybody was very uh, very sure of is, is to keep distance, stay away. Um, we didn't like, I didn't like calling it social distancing. I felt like that kind of um, led to feelings of isolation, like you're socially, um, you know, just distant, you're away. 
I just felt like that that led to more feelings of isolation. So we really wanted to focus on we're physically distancing. We can't be physically together and hugging and doing high fives and hanging all over each other. But socially, we wanted to create an environment where we were just as close and that they could have those close connections and communicate and, and really feel like they were together. Uh, so we have a picture of, I think this was our first day, where clearly only one of us, uh, Bobby Daly, our program coordinator in Winter Haven, looks like she knows what's going on. So that kind of summed up the, the planning leading up to the program is that we're all over the place, we're all working on things, uh, we're trying to figure stuff out. And this was the day, the, the day that we were going to find out if we knew if we really knew what we were doing. So I love this picture because we're all seem to be doing something different, but with the same goal. Uh, so we did have our Winter Haven teachers, our program coordinator, they collaborated with a lot. Uh, so our uh, program director at the time, Jen Brooks, uh, Bobby Daly and I, we did a lot of brainstorming and talking and, and just trying to figure things out and see what would work. And so again, because we teamed up, we had another teacher and O&M instructor from Winter Haven that was able to, to work with us. And in Tampa, we had a number of other teachers that normally do our summer transition program. Uh, they, they work our year round transition program after school and on the weekends. And everybody was just so excited to be with the teens and, and make something really positive for them. So it, it truly took all of us coming together and brainstorming and problem solving and making things work. So I definitely wanted to recognize all those folks. And now we have the rest of the untouchables, our students. I think this was our first day and you can see that the teachers are now facing forward, looking alert. Uh, we know what's happening, we know what's going on because that's what we do as teachers. Once the students get there, we, uh, we pull it all together. And then we have a collection of our students. I don't think it's all 23, but this is probably one of our biggest, one, one of our biggest groups. So it's a, a group photo of our morning Zoom meeting, our first meeting with everyone. And we just could not, we're texting each other as the kids were popping in and more were showing up and they were showing their cameras, which was shocking. And uh, they're smiling. We had students attend who normally don't come, who normally don't come to the face-to-face -face transition activities who either they're shy or they just don't wanna get out. Um, and so this, was another benefit. It allowed students to, to participate who normally wouldn't and really made some really good connections and friendships. So I feel like they weren't socially distanced. They were actually socially brought closer together. Um, and we wanted to create that togetherness. We, we tried to look at all the things that we would normally do face-to-face -face on our first day and see what would make sense doing it on a virtual platform. And one of the things we do, um, we have students in that we separate into smaller groups for our small class sessions. So we had a teacher assigned to each group and they went off to breakout rooms and the group's first task, which was a team building exercise, they had to come up with their team name. And we love the names that they came up with. We told them they had to come up with a team name or a group name that was untouchable. And then we just let them go. And this is what happens when you don't have teacher interference. You, you truly get the, the kids' creativity and they get to talk. It's a way for them to get to know each other. And now they're in this breakout room. So they have a smaller intimate session, maybe more, more likely to talk to each other and share and everybody's voices were heard. Uh, so we came back with, and we met the Hornets and they had a, a, a spokesperson from the group had to say why they chose this name. Uh, so we're trying to give students, again, that the same skills that we would if we were together in person, that somebody, so, so this would be practicing public speaking and talking in front of a group. So they had to nominate a spokesperson. The Hornet said they sting and people want to stay away. Uh, so this also kind of gives a little personality of the group. Some of them were just being silly or funny, and some of them, uh, maybe this personality of the group, they just... They wanted to do their own thing. We also got the shooting stars and that's because they're so high and fast, you have to pay attention to see them. Uh, the dark stars, the dark stars are dark and mysterious. People won't be able to figure us out and we shine bright like a diamond. 
the fiery stars. It's a cool name and we can be hot and spicy. We didn't ask them to clarify that, uh, but we love that they were, they were doing their thing and being creative. And then the phoenix, uh, the phoenix said, because they're, they're smart, it's a very fast bird that uses heat vision. So you can see that we have our, our groups are already from day one taking on their different personalities and they're connecting. We would say things like, okay, we need somebody from the fiery stars or the dark stars. You're gonna go out to a breakout room and head to this class. And they knew who they were. They had that, that ownership, which is really great because that's what we would, we would try to create again if we were in person. And our virtual summer e-transition program overview. Uh, we met from June 8th to July 9th. The last week was only work experiences and we gave students an opportunity to try a different work experience because some of them were really into what some of their friends were doing. So we, um, we shuffled everybody up the last week so they got to experience different types of, of the jobs that we had. Uh, so typically we met from nine o'clock to 11 o'clock a.m. first thing well, for a teenager, first thing in the morning. And we, we did a, a large group and then rotational groups. Uh, we started out with a guest speaker every morning at probably about 9.15 um, that was a career exploration guest speaker. So it was somebody coming and talking about their job, their career, how they got started. And then we split into our classes based on the group names and we worked on job readiness skills. From 11 o'clock to one o'clock, we decided uh, we wanted to give them a break. It's still summer. It's a lot of time sitting in front of the computer, even though most of them are sitting in front of some kind of a screen anyway. Uh, but we wanted to give them a little bit of a chance to take a, a, a break. So for two hours, we had lunch um, or whatever they wanted to do. They wanted to go back to bed, play video games. We left the, the Zoom. didn't want to leave at all. And they just hung out with us. Um, my computer just reset. Can you still hear me, everybody? Yep, we can still hear you. Okay, did the presentation stop for you? No, presentation still on. And now you're back. We can see you and hear you. Um, presentation looks like you're still sharing the virtual summer transition program overview. Is that okay. what you're, did that no. Oh, okay. uh, so maybe that's stop. okay. I'm stop going to stop. I'm going to yes. say stop and then restart. Yeah, let's should be see clear. what happens. Okay. All right. So we're still on our schedule. Back on track. Yep. Um, Perfect. Super. Okay. So, um, and then we came back at one o'clock. And so from one o'clock to two o'clock, um, is the sound okay now? Um, so yeah. said it was normal. I mean, okay. All right, yep. so from then in the afternoon, one o'clock to two o'clock, we had uh, more rotational groups and focused on money management and home management skills. That was one of our biggest challenges is how we always like, we always incorporate daily living skills, independent living skills. And we're like, how are we gonna do cooking and cleaning and, and all these things virtually? Uh, but we figured it out. And then from two o'clock to four o'clock, was the work-based learning experiences after the first week. The first week was getting ready, getting set, uh, doing uh, applications, interview, practicing for interview skills, having mock interviews. But the remaining weeks, the uh, late afternoon was reserved for work experiences. The career exploration part of it. So the preparation for this was a lot of fun. We uh, students completed an online application using Microsoft Forms. And on the application, they have to indicate their top three career choices. So they had to list three things. What do you want to do for a job? What do you want to do for your career? What do you want to be when you grow up? So we, uh, we met as a group and reviewed all of the areas that, that the students listed. Some of them said an author, a writer, somebody wanted to um, work in aerospace, engineering, forensic scientist, an actor, somebody wanted to be a small business owner, a baker. We had a little bit of everything. So what we, we do this every year, we've been doing this kind of since the beginning of our program, um, is we just sit around and say, who knows somebody? Who knows an aerospace engineer? Or who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody? 
who knows somebody who's a baker? Who knows somebody who's a professional singer or any kind of a singer? And we just really go through our contacts. One of the big things in the Job Seekers Toolkit is talking about the personal network. And when I first started teaching transition 20 years ago, I used to look at that activity and, and do it with the students, but I didn't, it never really hit me how valuable that activity is um, until I, I was teaching for a few years and doing transition and realized the personal network is where it all begins. Uh, so we just had a spider web of names, ideas, suggestions of people that we could contact and ask them if they would be interested in coming on to be a guest speaker. So we brainstormed a list of potential speakers. We each had our little homework sheet. We went out, we contacted those folks. Um, it was friends, family, coworkers, other community contacts. Um, I've, to me, this was so much fun because I reached out to people I maybe hadn't spoken to in 10, 10 years or more. I talked to some of my old um, Florida State University students, some of my old colleagues who had moved away. Um, I remembered some people on Facebook posting about their grown children and what their careers are. And I, I even got a, a teacher of the visually impaired from Colorado who used to work in Tampa, who, um, whose son works for a Formula One racing team um, in North Carolina. So it, the spider web just keeps going and going and going. And everybody we reached out to was more than happy to help. They were excited. They were glad to do something. They love meeting the teens and talking about their job. Uh, sometimes we were lucky and some of our guest speakers um, had a visual impairment or were blind. And so that, that acted as um, just extra because now we have a positive role model for our students and we have a potential mentor. So we had a little bit of everybody. Uh, we had just a chart that we set up to, it was a share like on SharePoint chart so that as teachers um, confirmed time slots with the guest speakers, they could just plug those into the chart. And that way we could just kind of have an, a running updated list of, of who we had and what time slots were open. Uh, every morning when we started with our, our students, we had one to two guest speakers. And we would let students know ahead of time who the guest speakers were, what their career was, what they're gonna talk about. And then students had to choose which speaker they wanted to listen to. So this was good, that having the choice of speakers that afforded students the option to have some ownership and decide if they weren't interested in one, hopefully they were interested in learning about another. And we tried to pair up so if we had more of a scientific tech, technological like speaker for one session, then we'd have somebody more in the language arts, performing arts as the, the alternative option. Uh, so that, that, just had, that just worked out, fortunately. Um, we didn't exactly plan that. Sometimes you don't plan things and they just work out. Uh, so this gave us a live presentation and interview format so students could ask questions right then and there. Some of them felt more comfortable asking their questions in the chat box. So one more thing that we don't normally get if we're face to face is that some students that are shy or a little more timid, they could write their question in the chat box and not feel like they're on the spot. Other, other students felt comfortable turning on their cameras. Some of them wanted to keep them off. Uh, some of them would text uh, or message us a question, the teacher, so that we could ask that question. But it, 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 it definitely gave a lot more options uh, for interaction. The morning was a little difficult sometimes to get the kids rallied, but we, we wanted to have our speakers in the morning just because we knew that's when we had the biggest group. Um, everybody was together. Uh, sometimes in the afternoon, students would have appointments or meeting with teachers um, from their, uh, their summer school programs that some of them were also doing. So our guest speakers, the career exploration that we, we were able to pull from, we had a bosun from what's called the American Victory Ship. So an actual old uh, maritime ship is turned into a museum. And so she did a tour, which is really cool. So we got to see the ship and she described and explained everything that was going on while she was there live and we were on Zoom. We had a baker and owner of We Vegan Eats, which was really amazing. Uh, we had so many kids that wanted to be either a business owner or a baker or a cooker. Some of them ordered um, cookies and baked goods from her website while she, was, while she was speaking. So they got extra skills there. We had a high level mechanic for a Formula One racing team, a registered dietitian, 
a 508 compliance analyst, a veterinary technician, a music producer, a professional singer, a social worker, a store manager from um, a store called Sprouts Farmers Market. And he wasn't able to do a live tour of the store, but had enough pictures of all the sections and departments and really um, described everything and went into detail about what was going on in the store and different entry level as well as long-term positions. Um, we had more, we had a band member. We had one speaker we called Zach of all trades. He's done construction. He was uh, a Marine in Marines radio repair, New York Mets training stadium facilities, restaurant manager, a little bit of everything throughout his life. Uh, we had a life coach and behavioral therapist, a toxicologist at a forensics laboratory, a massage therapist, aerospace and mechanical engineer, a writer, a university assistant professor of art and design, and uh, someone from the Humane Society, volunteer coordinator. Uh, and all of, these, all of these guest speakers were chosen because of our, our students showed interest. Either they showed interest in music, singing, music production. Um, they showed interest in art, different kinds of visual art. Um, interest in animals, caring for or working for animals. Everybody was um, really very relevant for what our students were interested in. So, and we can, like I said, we couldn't have, we could not have had this many guest speakers if we were face to face. And they came from all over North Carolina, West Virginia, Colorado, Kentucky, uh, all over Florida. It was just really exciting. It helped our students learn about time zones different parts of the country, we would ask them if they knew where, uh, where those guest speakers lived, what area of the country that was. And like always, we would have students write thank you letters after we had guest speakers, after their work experience, after a, um, a tour of a business. So we didn't wanna change that. This gave us a great opportunity for them to work on their writing skills, so more formal writing skills. And they, they communicated with their group teacher to write the letters and do some proofreading back and forth. And everybody, students were allowed to choose which guest speakers that they wanted to address so that it was a little more meaningful for them. So one of them, we have a letter, Dear Miss McCoy, thank you for taking the time to talk to us about your job in the Humane Society. I have a huge soft spot for animals and it's amazing that there are people like you helping take care of animals in need. Once again, thank you so much, sincerely, Kay. Um, dear Ms. Catlin, thank you for coming and speaking to us about forensic science. Learning about your job was very interesting. My favorite part was learning all about, was learning about all the different umbrella that forensics could fall under. I have a friend who's very interested in forensics and actually hopes to be a scientist one day. Um, so you coming to talk to us was helpful for them also after I told them about what you spoke about. Thanks a lot for all the useful information. I really like this letter. We had so, so, so many good ones because not only is this student interested in the field herself, but she, it shows us she went and then she relayed all the information that she learned to someone else. That's one of the best ways to learn is to talk about it and share it and pass it on. Uh, so just more, more benefits of having students together and speakers from all over. And our job readiness class, the skills, that probably everyone's focusing on, we were able to work on job seeking, looking up jobs online, figuring out where do you find out about job openings, looking at different job applications, practicing filling out a job application. We use Microsoft Forms a lot. It's very, very easy, user-friendly. I figured it out without any instructions, so that means it's definitely an easy one. To, to use and implement and it's accessible for our students with the, the technology that they're using. Uh, but we had them fill out a job application online, which we created through, through the, the forms program. Uh, and then job seeking, we posted all of our work experience job descriptions on our, our agency website. So they have to learn about looking for and a section on human resources or doing a search for job openings or employment opportunities. Um, they filled out a career interest inventory, learned about staying organized, about keeping the job. Getting the job is one thing, but keeping the job is very, very important. We 
we're able to work on workplace etiquette, post high school options, action plans, disclosure of a visual impairment, uh, filling out timesheets that were required and worker evaluations, and a lot of interviewing skills, interviewing practice, dressing for success, and actually having the mock interview. And for our job readiness skills, we really use the uh, Career Connect website, the Job Seekers Toolkit. They have resources for, for all of these areas designed for transition students and our population. Uh, so really, it's like a one-stop shop. Yay, good answer. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, from the beginning, we've been using uh, the APH resources. And really, if you're, if you're just overwhelmed, you don't know where else to go, just go there. Um, and then job readiness skills, the interview. This was the coolest thing. This is always one of our favorite days every summer because the teens will come in dressed up, like really dressed up and ready and, and looking their best and always, always would impress us. Um, and so we were just, we weren't quite sure how it was gonna work on Zoom. We didn't know how any of it was gonna work on Zoom. Uh, but the job descriptions were posted on our Lighthouse website. The, then students had to look for apply here. So we're trying to make it realistic to what they might find out in the real world. Using the Microsoft Forms, they had to fill out all the basic job application information, and we asked them to list what their top three job choices were, um, because we wanted to, to stress that you don't just, just because you apply for a job doesn't mean you get it, just because it's the one that you want. Um, and then we did virtual interviews via Zoom. We had people interviewing students that they didn't know. That was really important. The first few years we had the transition program, we would use teachers from the program that would interview students for the mock interview. And they would walk in and be like, oh, it's Miss Glazer. And uh, so we knew right away, like, well, they're not taking this seriously because they know us. They're not nervous. They're not scared. It's not intimidating. So for years and years and years, we made sure that we have people that they don't know, people who are intimidating or, or just people that they don't know. It's more realistic. Make them wait in a waiting room and, and kind of have to figure out, are they going to fidget? Are they going to sit up straight? Are they going to be on their phone the whole time? All kinds of things to talk about. So we did the same thing with Zoom. We have professional educators from our local school district and our instructional material center. We um, gave them a Zoom link and got them set up in a Zoom room. Our teacher that was assigned to each of those groups would also be in that Zoom room, but in the background. So none of our students were ever left alone with an adult or a person that they didn't know in, in any of the Zoom meetings ever. So the teacher was in the background uh, just listening. So students had to take their, they received an email stating, this is your interview time. This is who's interviewing you. Please um, notify them if you can't attend. We did have a few students that were sick and they had to um, notify, they had to reschedule their interview. And one of them did not start working the following week because he did not reschedule his interview. So how do you show up for work if you weren't hired, if you didn't have an interview, you weren't hired for a job. So this program lended itself to a lot of natural consequences, which we love. Uh, we love not natural consequences because it, it just keeps it real. And so they had to go to a different Zoom room. This was the thing that we were like, ooh, this is really gonna test their skills. We had students in our main Zoom room where we meet every day. They had to sign up, they had to leave our Zoom, and then they had to go to their email. They had to find the link for the next Zoom meeting, and they had to show up on time or early. Uh, so I was in the room, I was in the main room where everybody was hanging out and waiting for their interviews to happen, and we were practicing and reviewing. And we we did not say, so and so, it's your, you know, it's your turn to, to go to your interview now. Uh, we just periodically gave reminders and they knew usually most of them five at least five to ten minutes before their scheduled interview time they would disappear and they started showing up uh, for their interviews and they they were dressed for it it was really one of the the coolest things to see that it's still working they still get they're still getting it even though we're not face to face uh, so i put together a little collection of students that were dressed for success and we have one who's wearing um, he's got a sweater with a, a collared shirt and a tie underneath, another one that has a vest with a collared shirt underneath, another one wearing a black dress shirt with a tie. We have a few ladies, uh, one's wearing a polo shirt and another one just a, a simple v-neck uh, blouse and, 
and they they worked on their hair, they got their hair ready and makeup and anything that they would normally do, at least from the waist up. So they were they were ready. And then when they finished their interview, they would come back to our main room and tell the other students how it went, how they did, what they should have said, what they did say, what, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, it was just a really neat experience all around that they were able to share. Um, so that, that worked out really, really well. And then when we did our face-to-face -face program this past summer in 2021, we actually had some students that we, we intentionally signed them up for a virtual interview. Some of our interviewers were not able to come in person. And we said, no problem, we got this. We know, we know how to handle this. And it was good because it gave some students that needed practice with the technology and just certain targeted skills they they were able to practice as well so everybody was able to get interviewed and at the the format that best suited their needs do we have any questions so far i'll just keep talking <laughs> feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we will fill them to sue awesome or you can wait until the end and we will yep cover as well um so the home management skills this one again was kind of like eh, you know we could talk somebody through using a microwave we could talk them through um, cutting doing things like that at home but we all agreed that wasn't that was not going to be best practice um, because we know we have students with additional disabilities we don't know who else is in the household um, even something simple like microwaving a bag of popcorn if some students are not prepared uh, and they put their hand inside and open the bag right away, sometimes that, that's something that can burn them or, or if they're just heating up anything in the microwave, just not having a teacher right there to jump in if needed, um, even with, with cutting, slicing, shredding, just all kinds of things. We, we did limit the types of skills that we were gonna address, but then we thought, you know what, there are a lot of things that need to get addressed that we don't cover when we're face-to-face. Such as laundry and cleaning. Uh, this gave us an opportunity just to talk about sorting clothes, different kinds of products, labeling. There's a picture in the bottom left of a washing machine, a front loading washing machine, and it has high dots on it. So, one activity students were, were sent a, uh, labeling kits with high contrast markers, 2020 pens, tactile labels, uh, puff paint, so, a different variety of items to label. And the ones who labeled appliances in their homes, uh, most of them with, with parental supervision or consulting at least, received bonus points for one of our incentive programs. Um, talked about cleaning product safety. So the location that cleaning products are usually stored and why and why they should be labeled and just different hazards of, of of cleaning products, talked about how to label and organize one's environment, personal belongings and things, did some comparison shopping, which is really easy to do online, uh, talked about using the services now, the door-to-door the -door services for food delivery, talked about changing light bulbs and circuit boxes and what, is, what does that mean? We had somebody come on just to talk about state identification cards and the importance of, of obtaining a state ID card and early we did apartment hunting. That's one thing we do every summer that we thought, oh, this is gonna, we're really gonna miss out on this. We would tour different apartment complexes and learn about um, getting started, uh, making payments, paying utilities, everything that goes into it. So one of the apartment complexes we usually team up with, they were fantastic. I went to the apartment complex and I went through the interview um, and did it all on Zoom. So I brought my phone, we got the apartment representative, the leasing agent on Zoom and uh, went through everything that we would normally go through if we were standing in the office. And then she even gave us a tour of the property. We got into one of the apartments to see what it looks like. And uh, students had a lot of really good questions and they thought it was really neat when we were walking around and, and checking everything out. One of our students uh, towards the end, she said she wanted to do a, like a, a mini cooking lesson or demonstration for her classmates and she calls it fluffy coffee. There is a name to it, I'm not a coffee drinker, so I could not remember it, but it was something, I guess it was just pretty popular. Um, she saw how to make it on YouTube and she tried it. So she did this really neat, it was like a cooking show and there's a picture of her measuring 
water into a bigger measuring bowl. And at the top of the screen, there are about five or six of the teens that were focused and watching her and listening to her. And it gave the student uh, opportunity just a really good chance to learn how do you speak to a group. We had to give her reminders of, she would say, and then you put this here. So we, we gave us a chance to, to teach her how to be more specific and give directions and, and be a speaker. Um, and then there was a kitchen jeopardy game that was asking about all different kinds of appliances and things that you would find in your kitchen, what to do with those. Our money management skills, our, um, one of our teachers is a math teacher and she works with um, ESC students. So this was really a benefit to have a math teacher on our, on our staff. Um, she prepared lessons on the on credit and debt dangers, the ins and outs of paychecks, reading a paycheck, talked about inflation and taxes, budgeting and money tips for teenagers. We had a guest speaker, speaker from ABLE United, which is a tax-free saving program for individuals with disabilities. Um, she spoke to teens. We talked about banking using an automated teller machine. One of our teachers found an app or something, some program online where you it simulated an automatic teller machine, which was kind of fun. Um, we did a point store, which I'll talk about later, that, that really helped with budgeting and management. And we did some online shopping. Um, our Division of Blind Services every year issues students a stipend to purchase clothing, personal hygiene items, supplies, things that they would need for their work experience. So we, again, we wanted to try to keep everything uh, uh, the same as what we would do face-to-face, -face, but we thought we can't take all these guys shopping. Uh, what are we gonna do? So we issued them Visa, Visa gift cards or Visa debit cards so that they could do some online shopping. Each student had to make an appointment with their personal shopper, which was their group teacher. And they went through the list learned about look, looking at Amazon and different websites to order online, to pick out sizes, to maintain the budget that they had, how to check the balance on their gift card. Um, and some of them had to call back, their orders didn't come. Some of them, they were charged too much. So a lot of real life skills that we would not normally, we wouldn't normally have if we were face to face. And we, we decided to have everything shipped to the lighthouse, not to their individual houses. Uh, and that was mostly because we were worried, what if something didn't show up, uh, if they typed in their address wrong, um, we didn't wanna have to try to go back and forth just between their house and postal services or delivery or anything. We just wanted to get everything, know that it came in and then we would divvy it out and deliver to students. And we had stuff, we, had, we did deliveries uh, oh, every few days, definitely every week. Um, but they loved it. We would do those little door drop-offs where a package or a box would be left at their doorstep. And uh, it was just one more exciting thing for them being, being stuck at home. Our work-based learning experiences. These took place about two to three hours per day once we started the work experiences. Students received $6 per hour as a maintenance stipend. Uh, this is not a paycheck, and we stress to them over and over and over. We, we call in jobs, and we call it a paycheck, but we really focus on this is a work-based learning experience, uh, that they're not actually working for an employer, they're not hired, they're not receiving an actual paycheck. Um, some of them are worried about the uh, benefits, or, uh, or they might just, they try to fill out a job application later, and they say that they worked for a business when they, they actually did not. So we really focus on that. Division of Blind Services uh, offers the $6 an hour stipend. And it's for them to learn about working, to learn about budgeting their money, to purchase items or materials that they need for their work experiences so that they, they can stay on top of everything. Um, the materials that students needed for any of their work experience, if they needed materials, would be dropped off or picked up from their home. And this actually worked out really great. One of our teachers who's an O&M instructor would communicate with the student. So this gave them the opportunity to, they had to answer their phone, they had to check their messages and call back if a message was left, which is very difficult for teenagers. They, um, they then had to explain to the O&M instructor or they had to give their address. Uh, they had to talk about their house. He would ask, well, where's the house number? Is it on the driveway? Is it on your house? Is it on your garage? How do I know that it's your house? What does it look like? Is there a gate? Is there a gate code? Are you in an apartment building? 
what floor are you on? So this was a, a good opportunity for students to have to answer questions and be aware of their environment. So if they didn't know, they, they had to find out. Um, our driver also learned to ask, are there any dogs outside in your yard that I need to know about? Uh, so the, just a lot of, um, for us, unintended, unintended consequences. Essentially, we didn't realize all of these things were gonna be taught and, and worked on during the summer. We did uh, job coaching through Zoom. So normally we would have a job coach face-to-face -face working with the students on site. So each group of students at their work experience had a job coach, which was one of our teachers, but it was a different teacher than they had during their classes because now their work experiences were all, their groups were all mixed up. The uh, timesheets, worker evaluations were submitted weekly. So we came up with an accessible uh, PDF, fillable PDF so students could still uh, be responsible for filling out their timesheets. They had to have the worker evaluation submitted by their work experience supervisor or their job coach. And then instead of, instead of issuing checks, which is nice because we would take students to the bank and they could learn about the bank teller, basic banking, endorsing a check, getting cash back, we decided to um, deliver cash to the students. And this was because we knew some of them relied on us to go to the bank. They didn't have the means to get to the bank outside of the program. So we didn't want them to have uh, two or three or four checks received over the summer and then they couldn't do anything with them. Uh, but because we were doing deliveries pretty much every week, it, it worked out okay. Um, so students had to, during their interview, they put down on their job application what their top three job choices were so the interviewer had their application, had a list of the jobs that they're interested in, and also had a job description. So the interviewer could ask questions specifically about the jobs that the students said that they were applying for. We came up with a job title uh, and we had an employer that worked for each work experience that was assigned to that work experience. And then we had a job description with the roles, responsibilities, minimum requirements, and maybe special skills that were needed for that job. And students had to review the job descriptions, make their top three selections, and then sell themselves at the interview. Uh, this first one is called a children's storyteller. We called it a virtual children's storyteller. Our employer was Bess, the book bus. She drives around in a big yellow van and normally with face-to-face -face events, she goes to schools, community clubs, churches, any kind of events, and she gives out print copies of print books to children. We, um, she donated uh, several dozen children's books to us and we had them put into braille by some volunteer braille organizations. And this job as a children's storyteller you will read children's stories in Braille live on a virtual platform through Zoom or Teams or create pre-recorded read aloud videos that will be shared on Best the, Buck, the Book Bus's social media. The minimum requirements possess or ability to learn expressive reading skills. Fluent Braille reader at the pre-K through first grade level in contracted or uncontracted Braille. Have a clear speaking voice and outgoing personality ability to work with others, special skills needed to be a braille reader. We specifically said we wanted braille readers for this one because we have quite a few students in our program who are dual media learners. So they are print readers in middle school or high school learning braille. And most of you know how difficult that is if you've worked with, with that population for them that they it's difficult to learn Braille. They're not reading Braille at a 10th grade level. They're still learning Braille. So we thought this would be a nice non-threatening way for our teenagers to practice their Braille reading skills, but not feel like uh, just babyish or, or too or young by reading children's books, which was at maybe their Braille reading level because the purpose was to practice reading these children's books and read them over and over and over and over to become very fluent and expressive in order to read to this young audience. So we really wanted it. We thought this would be a really purposeful activity for our braille readers. And we had students with multiple disabilities. We had students that were fluent braille readers at their, their academic high school level. And we had some who are learning uh, the braille code and 
would practice the same book over and over and over until they were fluent. And we had Bess the book bus, um, the owner come on and she, she gave them hints and tips and pointers about doing a read aloud and how to use your voice and how to use your expression. One, of, one student in this program, he, wanted, he wants to be an actor or at one point he wants to be an actor. So we thought this was a great opportunity for him to use his acting skills. And he really, he did a fantastic job. Uh, our children's storyteller accomplishments. They read 10 books to either a live audience or recording. They inspired young braille readers. They even received fan mail, which was really cool and unexpected. But some of the groups that they did the Zoom uh, readings to were children with visual impairments and some of them are learning braille. Uh, we reached out to our local summer school programs and uh, children's programs at other lighthouses and offered for them to sign on to our Zoom storytelling session. So some of the kids, when they found out that our teenagers were reading Braille, were just, they were so, so excited. You're reading Braille? I'm reading Braille. Do you know about the Braille challenge? And it was really cute, their, their comments and, and things. Um, just great role, our teenagers were great role models for the, the children that signed on. Um, somebody had her, I think, like a relative sign on who was an elementary student and she loved it so much. She wrote a letter to our storytellers. It says, dear storytellers, thank you for reading to me. I enjoyed it very much. You guys did a wonderful job. My favorite book was the one with the crocodile. The storyteller did a very good job narrating the story. Thank you for reading to me, storytellers. And she signed her name sincerely. Uh, so she just, this was just a young girl who wanted to just let them know that she appreciated what they were doing. And it was a huge shock, surprise to the storytellers and great motivation. The next one was a product reviewer one and the employer, we work with our local material center. So the Florida Instructional Material Center for the Visually Impaired. Uh, responsibility as a product reviewer one, you will be responsible for reviewing products from American Printing House for the Blind. This could include educational games, toys, or other products. Assembly of products and inventory of parts may be necessary. You will read instructions, learn how to play or use the item, teach others in your household how to play or use the item. After completing the above, you will be required to complete a level one product review form, giving ratings, recommendations, uses, et cetera, for the product. So the requirements for this job were to have good communication skills, organization skills, a positive attitude, problem solving, can work independently and have flexibility. And special skills, basic computer skills are a plus. Uh, so really we wanted to give students, we, we dropped off, this is one of the drop offs, we dropped off items to them. And it could have been just something, a simple game, maybe web chase or Trex, the orientation mobility game. And we, we tried to find unopened products. That way they knew what it, they had to open it, the package, all the packaging, they had to put the games together, read the instructions. So really dig deep into each item and figure out how to use it and teach it to someone else. And this, this was just fantastic. And then the follow-up was a form and students in our product reviewer one group, we had some that had multiple disabilities. So writing a really formal review was um, a little more difficult, but the, the product reviewer one had more of a checklist and they had to give their rating at the end. Uh, so the accomplishments, of the product reviewer one, they completed as a group 14 reviews, reviewing 14 products, and they taught more than five siblings at home. So now they're working with their brothers and sisters at home. They're teaching them skills, positional awareness and spatial concepts and some math skills and all the good things that the APH products bring to children who are visually impaired, sighted kids benefit as well. And, and this was really sweet. We got lots of pictures of them working with their siblings instead of fighting with them. So we love that part. The product reviewer two, also the employer, Florida Instruction Material Center for the Visually Impaired. So each of these that say employer, we would have someone who worked for that company join the work experience group at least once a week to check in, to supervise, to give them tips, to ask how things were going, see if they had any questions. And then the job coaches were with the students uh, every day. 
the uh, product reviewer too, essentially the same, except we gave them more tech, uh, basic technology. Um, one of them had the code jumper, they had maybe a sound box, um, uh, just things that were a little more sophisticated and complicated, and they had to write more of a report. They have so pretty much the same skills, but more technology, um, knowing about accessibility options. They texted and reviewed six different products. They completed 11 reviews, and which was really nice, which we didn't plan, but the teacher just decided that this would be a helpful thing. Um, for one of our students that had difficulty with writing was to make a video review. And so then they had to work on appearance and getting the camera right and level of speech and pace of speaking and sticking to, to the topic. That one worked out really, really great. We would drop off products to the students. The students sometimes, and this was good, more natural consequences, sometimes they would be ready for their next product, but they didn't follow the directions, which was they had to communicate to our driver and schedule a pickup and drop off. So that was their part of their responsibility was to communicate with the driver, I'm finished with this product. Can we schedule a time for you to drop off a new product and pick up the one that I have here? And if the items weren't complete, if something was missing, then they couldn't get their next product either. So some students were a little, they didn't get to, essentially they didn't get to work. If they're not working, then they're not earning that stipend. So those are more natural consequences, which we would normally have if we were face-to-face. -face. We had the next one, a website accessibility analyst. And the employer um, for this one is Speedy Turtle. Dave Wilkinson is in Kentucky and he is blind. He's a uh, technology guru. He has his own company called Speedy Turtle. So he would Zoom with the students once a week and he uh, knows all the ins and outs of, of analyzing uh, websites for accessibility and products. And he gave them a lot of really great advice as well as being a great role model for the, for the students. Uh, and then one of our job coaches, she's also a tech guru. Um, they, their responsibilities were um, as a website accessibility analyst, you will be responsible for testing websites for accessibility for a variety of users. A summary report with recommendations and accolades will be provided to the business owner. You will be required to email companies or business owners to offer the website review service. The minimum requirements to have communication skills, organization skills, positive attitude, problem solving, working independently, flexibility, basic understanding and use of screen reading programs and or screen enlarging programs, typing skills, word processing skills, knowledge of various internet browsers, competent user of email, advanced technology skills, a plus. This was a really cool group because we have keep going oh, we have some of our uh, our technology um our technology geeks <laughs> they love this and again some that were they're kind of shy don't always want to show up face to face they were all over uh, these kinds of work experiences and and being involved uh, so andrea wallace was the uh the job coach for this group uh taught them with the help of uh, Dave as well, learned how to use the WAVE, which is a web accessibility evaluation tool. They created reports for CFO connections for FIMC VI for Pinellas Chocolate. They reviewed websites for Amazon, YouTube, NASA, Netflix, AFB, um, ALA is American Lung Association, Humanware, Freedom Scientific, and a racing site. So they uh, they didn't necessarily work with all those companies, but they were curious to see how accessible are their websites. And they learned a lot. They, they worked really hard and um, worked hard at producing the reports. Because some, some folks we find they want to work in technology, but they just, because they like technology. So when it comes to having a job where you, well, you have to send emails, you have to solicit business, you have to do a follow-up, you have to write a follow-up report that was not necessarily their strong suit. So this was definitely good real life, real life uh, examples of when you're working, it's not always gonna be the fun stuff that you like of the job. There are gonna be other sections that come along with it. 
Our next one, we had a social broadcasting correspondent. We were bound and determined to come up with really sophisticated, fancy sounding job titles. But this is essentially what we had, a social broadcasting correspondent. Our employer, Lighthouse for the Blind and Low Vision, we try really, really hard not to have work experiences based out of the lighthouse because we want them to get away from us. However, this worked out really, really well. As social broadcasting correspondent, you will communicate with a variety of individuals. You will need to come up with conversation topics and talking points. You may be interviewing people, discussing current events, telling jokes, all through a conference call format. So essentially they had to come up with a talk show and we came up with this idea as a way to get some of our older clients or adult clients who were used to coming in and getting that, that physical contact and face-to-face -face contact who are now home in lockdown. We wanted to give them something to maybe call into and, and listen to the teens and uh, try to everybody helping each other. The minimum requirements to have an outgoing personality, a clear and distinct speaking voice, telephone skills, communication, organizational skills. So essentially a lot of the same, the same characteristics needed, have good time management skills, ability to work with others, special skills, research skills, and use of a conference phone system is a plus. So we did not want to have a Zoom session. We didn't want to do a FaceTime or social media. We wanted to keep it very, very simple for some of our clients that are not up to date with, with the newer technology. So all they had to do was call in to a phone number. Uh, and the students were responsible for coming up with the topics and the show and they took turns. We had a little music segment. They did a joke segment. They would do social current events. What we discovered that current events for teenagers is not necessarily current events for adults, such as who, what actor or actress married who or who divorced who, uh, but it was, a, it was a great learning experience and the teens really took ownership. We had an artist on the group and they designed a flyer. They named their show The Wave. Uh, their flyer had this, the dates that, um, that they were meeting, the times, the phone number to call in and, um, they ran their show. So they aired six one hour shows. They reached a listening audience all around Hillsborough County, which is a pretty big county down here where we are based. And then at the, um, the extra week, students that wanted to try the social broadcasting correspondent, they changed it up a little and they offered a live show on Zoom and they changed their target audience to, um, to a younger population. And, and so that was, they really, they really jived um, well together and they they had a lot of um, current things for teenagers that teenagers would be interested in but they all took turns speaking doing preparation doing research coming up with different segments uh, so that was a lot of fun to watch and see just how it, it all played out um, another job title we had was our menu designer and our employer it's called braille with vision this is actually a fundraising business that we have for our transition program at the Lighthouse. Braille with Vision, they typically make magnets that have print and braille on them, just really like refrigerator magnets with funny quotes or inspirational quotes. But the idea was that there's braille on it for our braille reading students with vision for our low vision students. So there's print and braille. Uh, again, in our brainstorming sessions with all of our teachers together, came up with the idea to offer to uh, or to reach out to food truck vendors. We have lots and lots of food trucks down here. And a lot of times their menus are just plastered on the side of the truck or a big sandwich board. So students had to reach out to food truck vendors and offer to braille their menus so that if a patron ever came up to their truck and asked for a braille menu, they would have their menu. Uh, so as a menu designer, it says you'll be responsible for creating print and braille menus for community food truck vendors using specialized software and Microsoft applications. Responsibilities include researching food truck vendors and making contact via email or phone to offer the braille menu services. This is a good opportunity. We just um, received at the Florida Instruction Materials Center um, some of the K, uh, KNFB readers. So this was, this was a great way to get them started learning how to scan and get the, um, if we got print menus, 
If they got menus from online, they could copy and paste. They used um, Braille Blaster to translate the print into Braille. A lot of really good skills that students were using. And we had students that were Braille readers and print readers working together. And they, again, they worked really, really well together in tag team. The minimum requirements, a lot of the same, the communication, organization, positive attitude, problem solving. Um, we said basic knowledge of or ability to learn Braille translation software, typing skills, basic knowledge of Microsoft Word, understanding or willingness to learn basic design concepts and accessibility and Braille reader of class. We, we wanted to make sure, oh yes. I just wanted to give you a break to um, take a breath, but there is a good question in the chat regarding legality and privacy. How did you get all the documents signed and doing it virtual? Um, do you want to address that? Um, let me see. How do privacy concern with IT is made virtually? Um, do you mean meeting virtually together or when we had guest speakers? Uh, but the privacy concern when they were meeting over Zoom and the legality issues. So we didn't have any specialized paperwork to meet on Zoom. Uh, students signed up for the program. We had our typical like media release waivers. So having uh, permission just for general, just media being online, pictures, um, things like that. Um, and so I, I just remember at the beginning, everyone jumping onto virtual and a lot of questions floating around of what needs to happen, like how um, we just, went with parents were informed of the program and how it was going to be run mm -hmm. and signed their students up. So we left that up to parents to decide if it was the program for them. So I guess it's a, it was assumed that if the parents allowed them to participate, then they were okay with the virtual aspect of right, it. Right, absolutely. And, and most okay. of them, uh, they were doing virtual sessions through school. Uh, yeah. Some of them were able oh, to use okay. devices sure. that they received from school, like uh, school districts were fantastic. They allowed students to, to take either um, sometimes laptops or iPads or tablets. They were able to keep them over the summer so they could participate. Huh. Um, some, some districts would have internet hubs, like the bus, like uh -huh. a, yeah. an internet bus driver. <laughs> so yeah, so, that's so, yeah that, that, right. that, so rural that, that districts. That's pretty typical during this time. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I get internet access. Yeah, right. Um, it was. I think it was one of those. Yes. Um, I think we, we I, just I made think, it work. I was gonna say I think if you you probably have more of an issue if it was recorded and broadcasted, right? With well, the, it, exactly. With it was private. Yeah. Um, yeah. We used a private room. There was a passcode. Um, right. Yeah, we, so I think that covered you there. We you would, yeah. right, we always had the waiting room. If somebody joined the waiting room and they had a weird name or we didn't yep. recognize the name or because it didn't we did not let them in. Good. Um, and a lot of our students, which was fun. I mean, that's their personality. Yeah. They would put up like um, just something goofy, <laughs> dungeon master, whatever. And um, we would we would put a message in the box like, oh, please, please rename yourself or sign out and sign in again with a different name or right. call Miss Sue and tell her who you are. Because mm -hmm. we knew if you know, if yeah. you're supposed to be here, you know my, you have my phone number or exactly. something. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so that was, yeah, definitely we, we did. Yeah, we did take some privacy precautions, but there wasn't a formal document. Um, yeah, um, just, just typical permissions. And there's another question, which I think is an awesome question. Um, uh, for students who are not tech savvy, how did you ensure they would be able to use Zoom, search websites, check email, complete Microsoft forms, et cetera? That's an awesome question. Yes. yes. <laughs> they figured it out. We had the same question. And it's one of those things that um, like they just, if you want to participate, like they did. Some of them was very, very basic. They didn't answer everything correctly. Um, we, maybe we talk them through it over the phone. Um, for the most part, everybody we had, they at least knew they, they knew how to use their phone and connect. And if nothing else, they could just click the link, touch the link and you'll get to us. But we did one on, some teachers would do one-on-one -on -one lessons with students. We would walk them through things over the phone. Um, like we said, because we started going to virtual learning through school in March, a lot of them had a crash course like just enough to know better, essentially, uh, to get started. I, I know there were a handful of students out in, in some areas in one of our other programs that 
the family didn't have internet. They didn't have, like you said, the technology skills. Um, we did, I think maybe one who did not have literacy skills. So there were some students that had to, to do more one-on-one -on -one instruction with in a different way where they didn't necessarily participate in this virtual program, but they were reached out to, to, um, to have more individualized um, something for the summer. So we, we, I know we didn't reach everybody and because we normally have, like in Tampa alone, we might have 25 to 27, 28 students. So combined with both programs, we had 23. So not everybody was interested for sure. Some of them, they were just out of town or they said, no, thank you. Cause they didn't think that it was gonna be fun or they just didn't want, they just didn't want to. So I know we didn't reach everyone, but we definitely tried. Cool, so we cover any more for okay, now? Great, thank you. Okay. Um, not that, let me see. We're good, yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. I'm just putting your okay, email you. in, the, in the chat for people who mm -hmm. want the PowerPoint so they can email you. Okay, great. Um, and we had incredible dis school district support from our TVIs that work with the district, uh, just helping students from their end getting started or problem solving. Some of our students were still doing, we call it ESY, extended school year. They would do lessons. Students would leave, do lessons with their ESY teacher and then come back to our Zoom. So every year we, uh, several of our teachers that work the transition program also work for the school district as a TVI. So uh, we always have really, really incredible collaboration. That's just, that's one of the keys. We all work really, really well together. Uh, just have that attitude. So Division of Blind Services, our Lighthouse, our school district visually impaired program um that we're it's all it's all in the family like we're all here for the same reason whether they're getting something from us or them or there uh we do have a really nice nice setup going so we take advantage of it um our braille menu designers they learned the braille blaster translation program they produced six menus for umami smoke bobby daddies smoke and bowls dulce dough vegan international and cali community they got to, they did a lot of cold calls where they just randomly called food trucks. They got nowhere. <laughs> they got confused, confusion. They got, uh, one of our students is bilingual. So he spoke to some, some uh, truck owners in Spanish, which is great. Um, oh, cool. More great skills, just that community connection. At least if, if companies were interested, at least they, there's just a little bit of awareness out there that you might have customers who read Braille. What are you going to do? So just more, just lots and lots and lots of good skills, real life skills, especially those phone skills. Kids are not used to using telephones. They like to text everything. So that was really good. Um, our donation care technician, we, um, we try to team up with Simply Spring Thrift Store that we work with every year in a face-to-face -face format. And they had some uh, lockdown issues as well, but we we were able to donate a lot of items to Simply Spring, which was great. Um, as a donation care technician, you were responsible for ensuring the quality of gently used clothing items, accessories, and basic household goods. Items would need to be checked for imperfections like holes, rips, or stains, washed and cleaned, and folded. Items would need to be sorted by condition and type, poor, good, excellent, prior to being picked up for return. These items would be donated to thrift stores. Uh, this one was really, this was good. Some students in their interview, one of them said, when asked, why do you, why are you applying for this position? She said, because I want a job where I can help people and give back to the community. And we just thought, wow, that's really great. That's like, awesome. <laughs> it's appropriate. She's sincere. It yeah. was, um, it was just, they really surprised us in so many ways. And then sometimes not because we're like, well, this is what we expect of you. Um, <laughs> and the clothing, we had clothing donated some really really nice just all different kinds of clothes and items shoes household items a little bit of everything some of these clothes got washed three or four times because we would we would send them to different houses but the teacher uh and we we sent home um, laundry detergent if needed and the teacher would would have zoom sessions where she's kids are holding things up and they're asking questions she's explaining to them what the items are how do you look for holes and tears um they cleaned and matched over three dozen shoes washed and dried over 10 large bags of clothing and cleaned more than one dozen accessories or household goods. We have a picture of a young lady holding a box of Tide, a huge shoe bin that we had at our lighthouse that we would uh, mix up and shuffle up and send to kids' houses. 
And then a picture of a student holding a sweater on a hanger, um, the teacher watching her and another student holding up her little detergent box. But they, they loved it. They, they asked questions about what some of the clothes were. How do you wear these? What's right side up? And they got to hang clothes on hangers, on trouser hangers, different kinds of hangers. Um, they got to fold and sort a lot, of, a lot of really good skills that could transfer to the home as well. Uh, uh, there's another question. Sure. Um, did you create possibilities for students with lower cognitive skills and no use of body parts from the neck down and nonverbal? Uh, we didn't have any students that had limited mobility like that, but for students with just um, IND intellectual disability, all of these activities uh, and job duties could be uh, presented in a more simplistic level or could be made to be more complicated. So we, we definitely individualize to our student population. So students that need more assistance would get more assistance. Um, like we are saying with the, um, the student who um, was doing a product reviewer job, we put him in the product reviewer too because we know he loves technology, but he does not have the reading and writing skills of someone that we expected to do a full on like par several paragraph review. So they, uh, the teacher gave him the option to do a video review. So we just kind of brainstormed as needed for individual students, like what, what we need to do to make it more accessible, if that helps. Yep, okay. great, thank um, you. Sure. Um, let's see, I think that was, a, nope, that was it. Okay, I don't see any more yet. Um, and then motivation, we thought this was going to be the toughest thing is like they'll show up one day or two days, maybe to see like, eh, what's this all about, but we wanted to keep them. There's the seeking, the student seeking, and then we needed to do the student keeping. So to keep the students, we came up with a few ways to keep them motivated. First of all, there were friends. Secondly, food. Thirdly, um, working from home. We had an employee of the week program, a drum circle and games we incorporated, and then our points store. Our, um, the friends was kind of a no brainer that you'll be here, you'll be with your friends. Even if you don't care what we have to say, or you don't wanna learn anything. Do you wanna see your friends? Where are you gonna see your friends? So this helped reduce isolation. They still got to see each other and chat with each other and be there. We had small and large groups so they could mix and mingle. It increased their socialization. They had lots of shared experiences. Like we did this together. They had things to talk about. They could go back to school and say, yeah, this is what I did this summer. I made some money. And they had that sense of belonging. The food, we came up with the first morning, um, just randomly came up with a lunch run. This was a way to get kids to show up on time or early or just to show up at all. So each morning we would announce two to four names. And these were names of students that lived in a somewhat close geographic area. The students' names that were called, if they arrived early or on time, they went to the breakout room. The teacher took their order from a fast food restaurant of what they wanted for lunch that day. And then the teacher got, like we said, instructions about where do you live, your house, asked questions about the order, and stay within a budget. And then he delivered lunch to their doorstep pretty much by 11, between 11 and 11 o'clock. Uh, so then they got some kind of a special treat to their house. And it was cool because we could see the kids that showed up early if their friend's name was called and the friend wasn't there, we would see them on their phones texting their friend or calling their friend to wake up and get on Zoom so they didn't miss um, the lunch run. Hey, Sue. Would, oh, yeah. This is Richard. So we have a five minute hard end with the code and caption. Five minutes. Got yeah. it. Okay. Um, and then we left during our 11 to one o'clock lunch hour, we left the Zoom room open so that kids could come and just hang out and chat. And a lot of times they didn't want to leave, which was really cool because it showed us they wanted to be together. Um, they had the opportunity to work from home. So this allowed independent work and we, we encouraged it. The more they worked independently outside of that two o'clock to four o'clock timeframe, they had to keep track of the work that they did in their hours. They could practice reading their braille books, editing menus, analyzing websites, doing more clothing, then they would earn more money. So that was a great natural consequence for them. And some of them didn't really care until they found out how much money their friends were making and getting dropped off when the paychecks were delivered. So then they started realizing that cause and effect. The more work I do, the more money I can earn. 
motivation. Um, we started an employees of the week program. So um, each week teachers had to nominate one worker in their group for the employee of the week and they got bonus points, which I will um, tell you about the bonus points in a second. Um, but this is just a list of the students that were nominated and the teacher had to say, or job coach had to say what they, why they were nominated. So some of it was for positive attitude, showing up on time, dressing appropriately. Um, we did games. We helped um, Giving Tree Music learn how to and practice doing a virtual drum circle, which we did at the end of our program. We did um, Mad Libs or Mad Takes online, which is really funny. The kids had a great time just being doing nonsense. Some of the kids started a Dungeons and Dragons group that they are still, they're now doing today, almost two years later, every Friday night, they meet on Zoom and do Dungeons and Dragons. One of my favorite websites that we found is called The Game Gal, just thegamegal.com. And these are all games you can play just verbally uh, that did not need any materials or anything written. Uh, games like Fortunately, Unfortunately, Would You Rather, Password, No Because, Catchphrase, Three Things, Sing a Song, First Letter, Last Letter. These are all just verbal games that required students to pay attention, problem solve, deductive reasoning, working together, really the active listening. Uh, but they had fun doing it. We had a points store. Uh, students earned points for every day that they showed up. They earned points for arriving to sessions on time, for attending the full session, for completing assignments, for taking initiative, for having good manners. We kept track of, of all of their points. And at the end of the second week, we gave them their points totals so that we could determine how much the points were worth. Um, they then got a list of prizes and how much each prize cost in points. Um, so some of the prizes were folders, pens, bandanas, key change, bump dots, braille labels, bracelets, playing cards, fidget spinners, all kinds of random little things. They would go to Microsoft Forms and place their online order and they could spend their points. So essentially they could go shopping. The biggest hit was that we would do gift cards. So they could buy a five to 10 or $15 gift card with their points to pretty much any store that they wanted. And then we mailed the items directly to them. But that was definitely a really, really, really big hit is the point store. And they really paid attention to that and um, were motivated. Um, can't touch this. So our final slide, we learned all, we learned more from them than they probably learned from us as always as a teacher. We had one student, he held up a, a pile of kittens. He tried to sell kittens online. We had a show and tail session where kids would <laughs> hold up their animals. We have a guinea pig that we got to meet. We would meet puppy dogs and cats and all kinds of things. But some of the funniest things that we, we wrote down, things that the kids learned or said over the summer. One, I accidentally wrote hater instead of bagger at my Publix on my job, at Publix on my job application. So he said he was a Publix hater instead of a Publix bagger. Learned that at his interview. Um, would you like your menus boiled? Somebody said by mistake instead of, would you like your menus brailed? I'm so gifted. So you can see we have some good, some high self-esteem in our group. How was your interview? Someone asked, nerve wracking. Uh, the post interview, I had to go to my Instagram and censor it. So we knew right away that they were learning. Uh, I would never go in a dungeon with a man who has a tiny backpack. <laughs> I'm such an overachiever and our favorite, that's how we knew it worked. Thank you for making this fun. Uh, so we, we got great feedback from the teens and from the parents. And um, just, we, we learned so much, made stuff up as, as Dude, it went thank along. Thank you so much. And we have a hard end. So yes. we can close our captioning and give the code out. But thank you. And everyone's giving you a round of applause. I can thank hear you, thank that. Thank you. And definitely email me if you have questions. It's as in the chat box too. Great. Yes, thank you so much, Sue. My gosh, I, I always learn some new stuff from you every single time I'm on yes. one of your one of your uh, one of your webinars. So thank you all for attending. I'm gonna pause really with the recording. Start the recording. So thank you again so much, Sue, and thank you everyone for attending. Please reach out to Sue if you oh that's awesome. Thank you, Belinda. Belinda says best training ever. <laughs> Wonderful. I love hearing so thank, that. Yeah, thank you all very much. And um, please email us if you have any questions or email Sue directly for a copy of her um, PowerPoint. So we look forward to seeing you at our next um, training webinar.
Thanks so much, everybody. Be safe. All right. Stop the recording.